This is Beyond the Culture. Let's go. I'm so excited that you took the time to join us on the next episode of Beyond the Culture. This is the show where we embrace change and challenge cultural norms and ideals. I'm your host, Dr. David Walker. So, so I think we're going to get right into the conversation. Let me just uh, give you an official uh, introduction. Today, my guest is Dr. Eric L. Holmes. Uh, he is a senior coordinator. Now, I've been working all day on this word, so I'm going to try to get it. But yes, say E and T. <laughs> I, I got it as ontolaryngology. Odor laryngology. Say it again. Odor laryngology. All right. So I'll let you repeat it from now on. <laughs> but, but, but he works at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He has been a featured guest on many radio stations and magazines. Uh, Dr. Holmes is an author. Uh, his first book he co-authored uh, and it's titled Soulful Prayers, The Power of Intentional Communication with God. Then he has other works, The Power of the Sea. And then he has a brand new book out called My Next Season is Due Season. And we'll talk all uh, about each one of those books uh, shortly. Uh, he's a motivational speaker and he is a certified life coach. So I want to welcome to Beyond the Culture, Dr. Eric Holmes. Welcome, Doc. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it, Dr. Walker. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. I'm humbled just to be here with you. And um, I appreciate this. Um, and I take nothing for granted. And I thank God for the privilege and opportunity to share with you on tonight. All right. Well, listen, I guess I got to start with this ontolaryngology because you have to tell us what that, what that is and what that's all about. Um, it is actually the department, that's why we say ENT, is actually ear, nose, and throat. Okay. But we do so many, we have like about eight departments in one. Odor laryngology, um, it is actually ENT, ear, nose, and throat. Okay. But we also do with speech, we deal with cochlear, we deal with implants, we deal with um, hearing, audio, uh, we deal with speech. Um, so it's um, like eight departments wrapped up in one. We do hearing tests, audio for audiology and so it's just a actual department like with maybe eight in one but we deal with that that's why we just say ent ear nose and throat for most people and it actually was just um number one in the country um for this um this year of 2020 so our department was um ranked number one in the country that's excellent I, i've heard of uh john hopkins university i know it's an outstanding uh, medical school so the fact that you were ranked number one is not a surprise so ear nose and throat um we're all familiar with that how does a, a young man an african-american man like you find yourself in that particular career um well i've been at johns hopkins for 23 years okay. i've been in the department for two years um, working in healthcare, but I've worked in several departments in the institution. Mm -hmm. um, radiology, I've worked in our pet center, I've worked in our adult ER, um, I've worked in our OBGYN department, I've worked in um, our administrative services department. Um, so I've worked in, and then I've worked at our other campus. I worked like two jobs, like for 10 straight years. Okay. Um, one campus to the other, the division of hospital medicine our imaging department and our, our ER department at our other campus. So what motivated you to get into medicine? Cause you're talking about the medical field. What, there had to be something that inspired you to go down that route. Um, healthcare, um, because I love helping people. Okay. Um, I love to be able to make a difference in the lives of them. And so when they come in, we are the front line of defense that they see. And so whether they come in with a diagnosis, whether they come in not knowing or needing to know um it it when they leave you want to leave them with a good example you want to leave them leaving though they've come in one way they're definitely going to leave another way whether it's with a smile whether it's with information but we have to understand and know that even in healthcare, even being essential employees okay. um that we are the first ones they see 
And mm. so that makes the difference. That sets the tone for the rest of their visit. So you you use the the magic word or phrase, I should say. Um, we are, I think you said emergency. Um, essential. Essential, right. Essential workers. That's the term, essential workers. So when you use that term, obviously uh, COVID comes to my mind uh, because of the COVID crisis and, you know, who are essential workers, frontline workers. How has, if at all, your profession, uh, you know, working with people who have the, the you know, the COVID uh, virus, is there any connection at all? Has it affected what you do in the hospital versus maybe what other doctors are doing? Um, it hasn't. Um, me being on the front line because I'm one of the coordinators. We do scheduling. We do telemedicine visits. Um, but we do have a unit if someone does come in. Um, on the I'm in the outpatient center. We have, of course, the main hospital, but we have uh, different units that okay. are specifically if they do come in there, which are like um, our MPC four unit. Um, but they specifically like our purple team, we call it because that's more critical. Okay. Those units, specifically those nurses, those doctors, they are geared toward that. Mm -hmm. And so even when they come to our side, which is the outpatient clinic, okay. Um, a lot of things have been telemedicine, even for us, before the spike went back up, mm -hmm. uh, we were able, of course, they plexiglass us all in and, you know, we got shields, the PPE protection and all of that, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that people are screened before they get up to our, whatever floor they come on, like I'm on the sixth floor. And so they're screened. And so it's been a difference um, with the flow. Um, only because we were used to seeing maybe almost 300 patients a day, mm. which we couldn't do that with all of the guidelines and in, in, in the number of patients. So a lot of them were telemedicines, though it was starting to open back up, then the spike went back up. Mm. And so um, there was a shift, there was a balance. And so we just had to work through it. You know, it's it's just truly amazing. Actually, what we're going through. But let me ask you this uh, uh, this question: You're you're an African American in the in the field of medicine. Do you find that at least in the 21st century, um, you know, opportunities are are there for people in your field? And if there are, what would you say to someone who wanted to pursue a similar career like you? Um. It's, it's available and now more so now because of the criteria that you couldn't discriminate, you know, mm -hmm. um, challenges and circumstances that for uh, just say people who came along before me who paved the way. Right. Um, it's more open and available now. You just have to pursue it and go after it because uh, if you are experienced, if you have the credentials, um, if that's a field you 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 are going into, and you have say the qualifications or you know um, the experience, um, they couldn't just say, okay, they're not going to interview or they're not going to turn you away or something like that, only because then now you're looking at this is discrimination or you know so it's so much diversity now okay that that plays a part so with the diversity and and people are wanting more so to see that diversity it makes yeah. a difference now that that's great because um you know we have to open up doors you know to our young people uh to let them know that you know there's so many different opportunities for success that's available to them so to see someone like you uh, uh, African American black man in that particular role, I think that's very empowering for our young people. Um, but now I introduced you a couple of things, and I wanted to see which came first. I introduced you as an author and a writer, and then I also introduced you as a, a motivational speaker. So let me just ask which one came first, and then I'll know how to answer my question. Ask my question. Um, well, <laughs> the motivation has always been in me, okay. but the books came after that. Okay, so um, so let's deal with the uh, the public speaking. So how, you said it's always been in you, and you are you do it publicly now, and so tell me more about it always being in you. What would you say? As a young person, you were always the first to you know get on stage and give a speech. What what was the motivation for you to become a motivational speaker? 
Um, whatever is in you is going to come out of you and your right. passion is going to drive you to your purpose. Okay. And so as my first lady would say, you already are doing it before you get there. So whether I was speaking in school, elementary in school, I've always been a talker, always been able to influence, encourage and inspire. Um, always active, even in church and in, in so many different arenas. And so it was already in me. And so the more you grow, the more you mature, now you really know what your purpose is. And then um, once I moved, say, here, years later, here, I was always on radio, and now I'm actually a radio host. Okay. And so, you know, um, even also as a certified life coach, I'm always speaking. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even, um, even in the hospital or in healthcare, you know, you're always talking, you're always speaking to patients, you're always encouraging, um, you're always inspiring. So it was already there. And then even in my church being a um, the director of public relations now, but I also was the president of new members ministry. So I was teaching and always um, sharing and talking, teaching and training. So it was just already in me. Do you, do you have a uh, particular uh, topic that you focus on? Depends on the audience. Okay. Now I have, um, I have one class I'm about to finish for the John Hopkins university carry business school. And I'll be, um, finish with the executive business uh, management program. I'm um, so powerful public speaking. So when I was speaking to that audience, my topic to them was walking in purpose. So it depends on the audience or when I'm teaching at the library before all of this COVID and I was teaching on the power of the sea, but it was my audience, who is my audience and who am I targeting? Because that was a different audience than when I taught the power of the sea to a group of church leaders, okay. that's a different audience. Right. And then when I taught um, Walking in Purpose to Black Speakers Network, I was a spotlight speaker, that was a whole different audience there. Right. And so you just have to know your audience okay. and who the target audience is. That's, that's powerful because, um, you know, so, <laughs> so many times people get up and uh, they, they, they talk at random, they don't really, you know, have the right message for the right audience. And I think that's very powerful that you have to know your audience. But you also said that you are a certified life coach. Explain that. What is a certified life coach? Um, I, several months ago, I finished uh, Life Coach School of Arkansas. So I'm a certified life coach with credentials, which I coach people. Okay. Um, and actually, I'll be, I'm going to be opening up my own as well. I, my service is called um, the Power of Influence Coaching Services. And so I coach people and I help them to get to where they're going. Okay. And so being certified, credentialed, um, and not only that, now I'm one of the recruiters for the school and one of the teachers. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens when you do a great job. They, they, they yeah. put more work on you. So how, how has that gone? Because again, um, you help people to uh, get where they're going. And so how do you work that out? Uh, you, you have a conversation with people, uh, you find out what they think, you know, where they think they want to go, or how do you get that out of them so you can help them with their, uh, their journey, so to speak? One, you have to be a good listener. Okay. Once you listen, you can tap in to see where they are. Then you can help them to where they need to be going. And so one of the things is I'm a good listener. And so with a listening, you can know exactly where somebody, where they are. Okay. And so now I know how to tap in to the root of it to get them shifting to where they need to go. And so once I listen, once I observe, now I can help you move you from A and don't get stuck in the middle, but move you to Z. You know, I, I think that that's also something that you do that's vitally important because a lot of times people just don't know how to get there. You know, they want to get there, but they just don't know how. And I think that's a very, very powerful that you, you've taken on that, that responsibility because really all people do is need either one of two things, a little bit of a nudge or the right kind of guidance, you know? Yes. And, uh, and, and I think you, you really said it best. All you got to do is listen and take the time to, to listen to people and you can help them to get where they're going. Yeah. And that's one of the key things is just being a good listener. Cause most times all people need is someone to listen. Right. Right. Or to say you can make it. 
right. let me encourage you. You don't have to give up. You know, I used to work in the, our emergency room okay. and I used to triage patients. Okay. And so listening to their problem, hearing them, now you know whether they were urgent, non-urgent, emergent, everybody's important, but there's different levels mm -hmm. because if somebody came in with a heart attack, it's going to be different than somebody coming in with a toothache. Right. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we're just going right down the list here. So, so you are, you work at the hospital, you are a life coach, you do public speaking, but I really think you got a passion when it comes to writing. Would you say that? I do. And also because I'm a preacher as well. <laughs> uh -oh, there you go. I knew it was in there somewhere. I knew it was in there somewhere. So, so um, but we're going to talk about your books, but what, what inspired you to write? Because it seems like it's really deep in your heart, putting uh, pen to paper. What was your inspiration? What inspired you to write? One was, and it's so amazing, and I love telling this. Um, the thing about it is, and you know, when you tell Pocket stories, see, I did all of this. So uh -huh. when they were talking about stories and he began to talk about it, I had to do it. Pocket stories always gets people tell your story. And so one Saturday morning, I came downstairs to pray and mm -hmm. I asked God to bless me with a project that I could be a blessing to ministry, to my pastor and first lady and to the kingdom. And so after praying, I went into the kitchen, opened the door to the deck. It's a tree in my yard. He said, your season just changed. Your season just changed. And that was five years ago, not knowing it would tie into my book today. Um, and so turned around, he said, put it in the book, The Power of the Sea. And right from there, I began the journey. And everything else has just been right from there is, you know, writing a book, co-authoring three books, and now I'm doing another book. And so it started from there because I had no idea it was going to be a, a book when I asked for a project, but it was already in me to right. write, to release. Right. But here it is. Once he shared that, now here it is. I went forth. So, so you said you, I, I only have one, one book that you co-authored. Tell us about that one, Soulful Prayers, The Power of Intentional Communication with God. Um, actually, it's Soulful Prayer, Volume 1 and Volume 2, okay. um, which I am a co-author in, yeah, and Soulful Affirmation, but that'll be released in 2021. I'm a co-author of that one as well. Okay. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's a group of amazing authors under the visionary Miss Cheryl Pelote Williamson, um, who her vision that we are a part of, that our prayers are intentional. And so they are in a book. Mm. Our prayers are intentional. And it's a book of prayers that have been a blessing to so many people. And it's intentional. Absolutely. Now, now the second one, you, you kind of talked about it a little bit. You said the power of the seed. Tell us about that book. And um, what's something in that book that we need to know about? Now, that is my first book. Okay. That's what he gave me, The Power of the Seed. Okay. Um, the Power of the Seed, and I'm really passionate about one, it's my first, but The Power of the Seed has gone so many places. Okay. And when we talk, that's why, you know, you saw me getting all hyped when they were talking about seed and planting uh -huh. seed. Sure. It just, it, it's just in me because I also did a workbook to it, a worksheet, and I do a Power of the Seed masterclass. Okay. But the Power of the Seed, it's, it's from the natural aspect and spiritual aspect of seed, planting, sowing, but the preparation and process. And from the agriculture standpoint to the spiritual aspect of it, I help people understand how powerful the seed is. But before you can seed, plant, or sow, there's process preparation. But even once you do that, once you get to the middle process, there's the warding, the nurturing, the harvest. Then as the seed germinates through the underground process, it will get to the set time seed and produce what that has been sown. But uh, the key, is you can't rush the process. You've got to go through process, preparation, seeding, sowing, planting, then the warding harvest, the nurturing, but it's the waiting period. Mm -hmm. So while you wait, you must be doing something in order to receive the harvest, but you just can't rush the process. You can't rush the seed. Can you, can you give me uh, an example of a seed? Because I know that there are some people who go to church and they, they'll probably pick it up, but then it may be somebody who may not have a full understanding of the seed and all is entailed. Is, is there more than one meaning to the word seed? 
Yes, here it is. So from the natural aspect, the mm -hmm. farmer, right. it's a way of living, it's produce, it's his living, it's his livelihood. And from the agro stand part, you know, I love this too, because I studied Jewish history for my doctoral and the laws of the harvest, seed time and harvest. But here's the thing, that's from a natural. We as believers, our tithes are given, we seed, mm. looking for the expectation of a harvest. So it's not just in the, the seed or as we plant, but we are planting seed. It's just in the financial aspect of it or in our time, talent, our tithes, we are seeding and we are planting. And so in the spiritual, then we're looking for a harvest. But what I also allow them to know that it just not comes back, it doesn't just come back in money, whether it's in good health, whether it's in favor, whether it's in the door open, whether it's for your children's sake. So I've planted seed and I'm looking for the harvest that it's gonna produce. Now how it comes, you know, God has all of that. Right. And so we got to look at it from two different aspects, from the natural, from the, the agriculture, from the spiritual, and there's a difference. So when I teach it, whether I'm teaching it to non-believers, mm -hmm. whether I'm teaching it in the library, whether I'm teaching it to a group of church leaders or, or, or saints in, in all, here it is, know your audience. Right. Because when I teach to somebody in the library, they're not going to get what I teach to the church leaders. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's why I was, I, I wanted to, you to bring that out. And especially when you talk about uh, that, it's not just money, even though it is money, sowing money into the kingdom, uh, reaping and harvest, sowing and reaping. Uh, but you also brought out time and talent though. That, that is so powerful when it comes to either the church or the secular world, because, yeah. you know, God can bless us by helping people, you know, outside the context of the, of the four walls of the church. So, um, you know, uh, and, and what's the scripture? I think it's in Genesis, as long as the earth remains. See, so, in 22. Yeah, yeah. It'll be always one, time and harvest. Time and harvest. Yeah. And I think that that is a fundamental principle that God put into the earth realm. I don't think it's just for believers, because I think you can... Uh, be someone maybe not necessarily of faith, but you can you can uh, sow seed, you can you can give, you can you can uh, help people, and there can be rewards for that because it's all about the the principle. I think that that's more powerful than anything else. Would you would you agree to that? Yeah, and it is a principle because he said he reigns on the just as well as the unjust. So you could be someone who may be able to help somebody in need. You're planting seed, you're helping, but then he it's going to be a reward because, you know, he's also said when you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto him. And so the stipulation is, you know, and one, when you're doing it with the right heart, the right intentions, you know, what I mean, God can bless it. And so whether it's the natural, the spiritual, whether you're the believer or not, it, it, it it's all in the word. And so um, when we look at the seed from different perspectives, That's right. you know, as long as we're seeding and planting whether it's our time, our talent, our tithes, because someone without a job may tie in their time, mm -hmm. their talent. Mm -hmm. Now I may be working so I can give not only my time, my talent, but my tithes. That's and right. so here it is. I'm seeding, I'm planting, I'm sowing. And the scripture says you'll reap what you sow. Is that right? Yep. Galatians 6 and 7. <laughs> uh, and you got one more book. Um, I don't know whether it's the last book, but it's, I know it's your newest book. My next season is due season. Talk about that one. Wow. My next season, due season. And when I went back to the illustration about the tree and he said, my season just changed. My season had no idea that five years later, here will be a book dealing with that. My next season is due season. And it was birthed out of an experience, even birthed out of a wilderness experience. But this was a three-year process. But I really allow readers to understand and know this. You cannot rush or skip the seasons trying to get to the next. Okay. You must endure one to get to the other. Whether you're in your night season trying to get to the morning season, you must endure. And you cannot skip season and here it is that's why on the book it shows the different seasons now we know as as believers we say the fifth season is our due season right, right but here it is 
you still got process and preparation before you can get to the next season. And you cannot skip the seasons. You've got to endure before you can get to the other. But here's what I also allow them to know. What have you learned in the season that you were in before you get to the next season? Because before you get to that one, you have, what have I learned? What have I applied? What have I gained? Mm. What have I self-examined? And so when I get to my next season, I'll know how to handle the next season that I'm going in. And if this one happens to come up again, now I know what to do with the season that I had to go through to get to my next season. So here it is after I've gone through all of that, my next season is my due season. My next season is better than the season that I had. But the season I was in was maybe a, just a learning experience. It was just a preparation to me to get to my next. And so I want believers to know that in the waiting process, it's waiting. And don't get stuck in the middle of the process. Don't get stuck in the middle of the waiting. You've got to see it before you see it and recognize it when it comes. And so one of the things on... um it allows them to know is that this is recognizing the process of preparation not only that developing the right posture and cultivating your waiting season because we get stuck in the waiting season but then you got to understand the avoid the anxiety we get anxious and the script said don't be anxious for nothing but right. here it is waiting for the manifestation of my next season, my due season, but then maintaining the proper perspective. You got to see it with the proper perspective and see it from another perspective of it. But then here's the thing, recognizing when the due season comes. So you got to go through the process and preparation. Now you got to go through all of this to get to knowing that I got something on the other side coming. Oh, it's on the other side, right. but I got to go through process to get to it so i can't rush it because just like gold and diamonds if it does not go through the whole proper process it'll never be pure because all the impurities have not come out and just like us we gotta be we gotta go through the the process and preparation to be mature enough to be able to handle what god has now we talk we was on with billionaires and millionaires that's right everybody won't be able to handle that because if you can't handle where you are you sure can't handle a billion or you sure can't handle a million <laughs> process preparation the waiting period but how we wait and our posture how we wait says a lot to god you know, I, I like the part where you said you can't skip a season. So many people want to get to, I guess, the finish line or, or hurry up and get the blessing. But life is all about the journey, the process. You talked about preparation, going through different stages. And I think that that's where you become better off when you can... I guess, really suffer through the journey. Because when you skip a step or skip a season, you're really going to end up undeveloped. You know what I'm saying? You're going to end up undeveloped. And usually the, 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 the blessings come from actually going through the process, not skipping, not going around, not saying, Lord, you know, remove this, you know, from me. No, you have to go through certain trials, tribulations, and struggles. But when you come out, as the scripture says, you'll come out as gold. Um, and then again, you have to go through the fire, right? That's also in the word Absolutely. of God. That's in the word of God. But I want to shift just a little bit um, and talk about, you, you mentioned, I know you mentioned uh, your, your pastor and your first lady, and we'll, we'll ask you the name of your church later. But um, I want you to just to tell me two or three people who were most influential to you in your life. Um. One, my mother who transitioned about five years ago. Okay. Um, definitely influential. Uh, my big sister who is, uh, it's eight of us. So my sister who is the oldest, um, definitely because she was like my mom as well, okay. my big sister and my mother. Um, and so it was a lot. And not only that, a lot of people like I had counselors and I had, you know, um, teachers and counselors and then one of the other people who transitioned as well was my former pastor the late apostle weapon so they played major roles in my development and who i am today uh give me give me something that maybe one of your teachers did to influence you 
Um, and it's so amazing because I, I wrote an article in, in Communique magazine, which will be in this issue, this month's issue, um, with Brian McKnight on the cover. Um, so I'm super excited. But I wrote it called The Demonstration of Love. I had a biology teacher called Dr. Love. He made me take an exam over when I finished. Okay. He said, and I know you can't be finished. And then, you know, of course, I had to make sure because my mom worked for the school system. My sister was on the school board. So it's like, I'm going to call your sister. So I was like, I made sure. But here's the thing. Because they saw the value. Like we teachers, when we were coming up, the value and the, what they poured in us. And they saw the greatness in you. So he, he made me take my exam over, my final over. But, and I'm so glad because not only, then I got an A. So here's the thing, had he not been uh, the passion and love he had for teaching and the students, he could have just said, okay. And I could have failed, which would have messed my GPA up, which would have messed up the academic scholarship that I received. Okay. And so the love that he had and the passion to help the student okay. and see beyond the now, but see the future. And here it is. I did it, took it over, and, 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 and passed the exam. And so that really was a blessing because I had another teacher like that. They really cared about us, our, our guidance counselors. You know, I'm still in contact with everybody. I graduated 35 years ago, class of 86, and I stay in contact with everybody. And, and when we had our, our last reunion, um, our 30th, uh, one of our teachers was the keynote speaker, but we stay in contact with all of them and they cared enough and they loved us enough, but they pushed us. Wow. They pushed us. That's, that's great. It's important to have uh, people in your life. You know, sometimes when I have a guest on, I always uh, will ask this question. Matter of fact, I even asked it in the conference that we were at, I should say in this weekend. Um, because sometimes people do a lot of great things. You've done a lot of great things. You, you're in the medical profession, you're a public speaker, you're in ministry. But oftentimes ask people, uh, what would you say, if at all, that any uh, regrets, any big regrets that you might have had in any one of those fields that you like to share? Um, one of the things was, I was actually, I've always wanted to be a lawyer because okay. I love to talk. Uh -huh. But that was a passion, and I was going to go to school um, to Morris Brown um, in Atlanta. However, then I thought about, all right, when my mom got sick, you know, um, then I didn't want to do that. You know, I went to the, the community college in PA, where I'm from. Um, so one of the things was, had I gone there, but then I have to look at it. Was it in the plan and will of God? Because I wouldn't be probably here where I am today. Okay. So you look at that, and not only that, um, some of the jobs I may have chosen. Um, it, one of the other things was um, that I took a career, a job for a career move. Mm -hmm. And 10 months in, it just didn't work out. It just wasn't for me. Okay. And, but I took that and applied what I learned, self-examined. But out of that came a whole lot of things. And so many times we look at things from a bad perspective yet I saw the good out of it because what came out of it was a whole lot more than I went in mm -hmm. and not only that I'm further than what I was but it prepared me for where I'm going all right um let me ask you this question and first I want to uh we've had a great conversation and I want to thank you for taking the time to be with me on today but um before I get to my final question, let me just, are you, are, I know you, you write uh, because of the books, but are you reading anything um, that you want to recommend? Any, anything that uh, uh, another author, a must read book that you? Um, I'm trying to think, I, look, and I just, and actually I just got a couple of them. Okay. I'm just trying to think of the names of them. One is, um, cause I'm always, well, one of the ones I, I will definitely is actually, she's the visionary of Soulful Prayer Volume 1, Volume 2, and um, Soulful Affirmation that will be released in 2021. But she has a book, which is a 365 day like journal uh, called Affirmed. Okay. And it deals with the affirmations. And I, be I believe when people, when you write them down, actually it's on here called Affirm. 
And so even in my journal, I write my affirmations, but she has a book called Affirm, Cheryl Pellote Williamson. And it is a blessing because uh, it helps you understand in these affirmations and being the firm, and when you, when she said, write them down, when right. Ms. Deborah said, write down, I was like, oh my God, I, I've been writing all my stuff there. And she brought it out, write it down. And so that's what these affirmations allow you to write it down. But when you write it down, believe what you wrote down, then put your faith into action, knowing that it's going to happen. And so one of the books I would recommend is Affirm. Okay. And just give me the author again. Uh, Cheryl. Pelote, and that's P-O-L-T-E, and it's Williamson. Okay. Um, as, as we close, um, I'd love for you to leave us with an inspirational message, something that you could share that we, uh, as an audience on Beyond the Culture, can take home with us. Um, I would leave. Quitting is not an option. Let faith be your driving vehicle of where you're going. If you are able to endure the, the wilderness, you'll be able to enjoy the promise. Because here it is, you have 60 seconds between night and day. All you gotta do is last to in the morning. Don't allow your dreams or your visions to die and don't allow anyone else to cause them to die. Keep dreaming until you see the reality, until it gets to the manifestation. And whatever you do, Keep pushing, keep pressing, keep pursuing purpose that it might connect with destiny and do like the eagle. Keep soaring because one thing about the eagle, not only do they go through the storm, they rise above them. So anything that might be on their back is going to fall because they have risen to another altitude. So just keep rising, keep soaring, and knowing that whatever you declare and whatever you speak, believe it by faith that it's going to happen and keep God first and foremost. And I promise you, you won't go wrong. Amen, amen. Dr. Holmes, how can we contact you on social media? Um, I am on Facebook, Eric Holmes, on IG, Dr. E. Holmes. Um, I am on Twitter, Dr. E. Um, I am on LinkedIn, um, like all of the social media. So you can reach me. And even if you go on Amazon, my email's on there. If you pull up the power of the seed, or if you pull up my next season is due season, it's a bio in there, it's a description and my email and all the information's on there. You can contact me on any of the social media websites. Or on Fridays, you can catch me on Power 4.4 Radio, The Power of Influence, which is Dr. E. So 6 p.m. to 8, you can download the app and tune right on in and see me every Friday <laughs> for a two hour show. All right. Well, Dr. Uh, Holmes, I thank you for being on the show today. You have really inspired us. You have lifted our spirits. You've motivated us uh, both spiritually and naturally, amen, to go forward, to press on forward. And as I say to all of my guests who come on the show, you've gone beyond the culture. And I thank you for being with us. And I thank you. And always shout out to my current pastor, First Lady Bishop Richard and Lady Patricia Pender, who's I've cultivated and helped me from where Apostle left to take me further into my destiny. So thank you so very much, Dr. Walker. I appreciate it even sharing on here with you, your listeners. Not only that, but sharing in this wonderful, impactful experience that we had the pleasure of being on with Dr. Will and man, uh, this Genius Academy, this Give Me the Mic. It was such a blessing and to it be was. able to share with you. So Thank you so much. I'm humble. I'm honored. And thank you. And God bless. And may God continue to bless you, your show, and to every uh, listener that have tuned in on tonight. All right. And you take care. Now, if you want to continue to hear inspiring interviews like the one you heard today, I want you to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. Also, rate the show and please leave a comment. I would also love it if you would share this podcast with your friends to let them know that we're on. Finally, please go to our website at www.beyondtheculturepodcast.com or you can email me at beyondtheculturepodcast at gmail.com. On the website, you can subscribe to the show and connect with me by leaving your email address. 
I'd love to hear from you. This is your host, Dr. David Walker, and we'll talk again on Beyond the Culture. Take care.